In the story of Ruth, what is unraveled at the beginning is brought back together, put back together at the end. So a family is wiped out. All of the husbands are lost. Ruth loses her husband. Naomi loses her husband. Orpah loses her husband. And at the end, we learn of a new husband. A husband called a redeemer. In the story, it tells us that what we're about to experience is a Leverite marriage. Meaning that in the tradition of passing on land, they needed a, a male to pass it on to. And they wanted the land to stay in the family and not move outside of the family. So to do that, you married within the family and you were offered sort of in the line of who's closest to you, right? And so what the story tells us is that Ruth, who has already made a relationship with Boaz, and Boaz is already connected with Ruth, they've acknowledged that they are kind and compassionate to each other. They have acknowledged that each of them wants what is best for Naomi. And so Boaz has gone to the center of town where he will make the offer fix the problem of Ruth and Naomi not having a man to own the land. And so he goes to town and he meets Mr. No Name, right? They call him next of kin. And when he sees Mr. No Name, he says, did you know that Naomi is going to sell this piece of land? And it's so that it doesn't pass out of the family. Do you want to redeem the land? And he says, oh yes, because who doesn't want more land, right? But then when it gets to the part where he finds out he will have to take Ruth along with the land, which I have all sorts of questions about and issues with, but <laughs> he hears that he has to take Ruth as part of the deal for the land. And he's like, oh, no, 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 I can't redeem it. And that's when Boaz steps up. And I wonder if Boaz meant to lay it out that way to make him realize that this isn't really what he wanted. That the land wasn't worth having another woman enter through the household that you already have established. And so Boaz says, then I will redeem the land and Ruth will be my wife. So what was broken, what was lost, what was disintegrated, a family, husbands that had died, are now being repaired and renewed in this scene with Boaz saying that I will be that husband for Ruth. But that isn't the only way in which what was broken at the beginning becomes repaired at the end. When we hear this story, the second part of that story is we learn that Naomi lost her children. That her children are gone. And because of that, she feels bitter. And here at the end, it says that God came upon Ruth and allowed her to conceive a new baby. A baby that at the beginning of the story when Ruth and Naomi enter Bethlehem, the women in town come to them rejoicing, but they encounter Naomi who gives this speech about how bitter and empty she is. And here at the end, that same group of women come back into the fold singing about the glory of God and how God has given this new baby, 
a baby that made name Obed, meaning servant. A baby that takes that emptiness and brokenness and helps to heal. Because it says in that scripture that Ruth, Ruth, is better to you than seven sons have ever been. That those sons that she lost at the beginning, while they are replaced by Obed, are mostly replaced by Ruth. Ruth, who is better than seven sons. Ruth, who has done everything she can to make sure that her and Naomi are taken care of. Ruth, who has fed them and found them shelter. Ruth, who has provided for them. Ruth, who at this point in time has found the Redeemer, the one who will make the family whole again. And so those women come back with joy. What was broken becomes whole. What was broken is healed. Now, I will say that this isn't a healed as in we've forgotten what happened. Because you can never forget the loss of those you love. You never let go of that loss of sons and daughters and husbands that have died. They are always there with you, always with you. But how Naomi sees that relationship has changed. Because in the beginning, we hear her talk about being bitter. She talks about how she has gone from being a woman who was full and is described as a woman of pleasantness, of joy, to being a woman who is empty and bitter. So much so that she changed her name from being Naomi to Mara. Although the rest of the book never calls her Mara. But here at the end, she's back to being Naomi. Back to having that sense that it's no longer a feeling of emptiness and sorrow that I am with. It is no longer bitterness that, that surrounds me in life. I have now become pleasant again. I have now become able to experience joy again, to be filled again. So in seminary, um, one of my Old Testament professors argued that this passage here, which talks about them going from being empty to being full, really wants you to know that Naomi was literally filled up, which is why when they say that Naomi cradles that baby to her. That the language there implies that she becomes her, his nurse. Now the argument is that that's not literally what happens. But my old, prof, prof, my old Testament professor wanted to argue, but it makes sense for her to become the nurse. Because then she is literally filled up with the new life. She is literally now able to be full of what brings life. Whereas before she was empty and bitter, now she is full. At the beginning of this story, Naomi says this of God. Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? At the beginning of the story, Naomi believes that God has left her, that God has deserted her, that God has embittered her and has dealt harshly with her. That God is not the God that she thought God was. At the beginning of the story, she has 
broken her relationship with God. In that she feels like God is no longer there with her. That God is no longer bringing good into her life. That God's presence is no longer there in those midst of that sorrow, in the midst of that tragedy of having food. But at the end of the story, we hear different words about God. We hear a different understanding of who God is and what God does. The first description is from verses 11 and 12. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you produce children in Ephrathah and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So the first blessing or the first thing we learn about God in this passage is that God has this long generational plan that we often don't know about and can only see when we look back, right? And in that plan, Rachel and Leah, if you remember this story, are the wives that helped to found the 12 tribes of Israel, that they and their servant women birth Israel as a nation and birth those 12 tribes. And so this prayer to God is a prayer that Ruth will be in that same lineage, right? Will be in that same lineage of a people who creates the people of God. And so what do we know about the story of Ruth and what happens? What we know about that story is that Ovid is the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. The king that everyone in the time of Judges is yearning for, calling for, wanting. That Ruth, like Leah before her, like becomes part of that lineage that God has intended for God's people. Part of making the message and meaning of the story of God go forth into the world. That Ruth takes her place as those women early on in the ancestors had their place. And to make it clear what part of this lineage we are from, it talks about Tamar and Judah. It tells the story of how Tamar was married to Judah's son, and the son dies, and the next son dies. And so Tamar has to figure out a plan so that she can be part of this lineage of God. And so she tricks Judah into having a child with her. And that child, Perez, is the lineage that leads to Obed. <coughs> that child, Perez, is the lineage that leads us to the place where we get the ancestors of King David. And that's part of how our, Naomi's understanding of God has transformed or changed. That where she thought that God had turned aside from her, she now realizes that she is part of God's plan. She is moving in the direction God has intended her to move in, that her lineage is part of the greater lineage of salvation and redemption. But that isn't all that they sing up there at the end. Then we hear, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. She has been redeemed. 
She's been restored to life. She has transformed what was a understanding of God full of bitterness and loss to an understanding of God as one who fills you and nourishes you and restores you when you've been in that place of sorrow and loss and emptiness. What I like about this story, or what is interesting, is that normally, I'm like, oh, this is a little too quaint, right? They wrapped everything up and it's all nice and neat. But it isn't an easy, nice and neat, right? Because in order to get to that place, it shows the struggle. Unlike with Job, who cries out for a redeemer and gets redeemed in the end, it's like miraculous. One minute he is arguing with God and the next minute he is full of children and cattle and gold. In this story, we go through the process of that redemption, right? We go through the process of having to work through your life, of figure out how to make a new life, a different life, when your old life has been destroyed. We move through this story knowing that it is not easy, and it has a lot of doubts, but as we work our way through life, we can choose a new way, a new path. We can choose to see the presence of God where all we had seen is emptiness. We can see the presence of God helping us to find our way into a new place, a new beginning. That's why this call for redemption and for a redeemer to come feels to me a little different from Job. It feels more complete because we see those steps that Ruth has to take in order for Naomi to experience fullness and life. And I love that line where it says that this one this woman and this child, they are to you the restoration of your life. They are the nourishment for your future. I wonder what that looks like for us to think about who it is in our lives that help us to be restored when we're in those moments where we're feeling empty and broken who is it in our lives that provide the nourishment and refreshment that we need that restore us to a place of feeling full? This week I watched a talk by Father Greg Boyle. And I don't know if you know who that is, but he is um, a priest that works with the gang members in the Los Angeles area and has, has created a whole um, network and organizations to help people move out of gang activity into employment in the world, but also takes those gang members who have ended up serving prison time and helps them to get the skills they need so that once they are released from prison, they can lead lives that don't skirt the edge of the law. And while he was sharing in this talk, he was asked to share a story that describes what his new book is about, which is about the tenderness of God, the tenderness of love. And when he sits and stops and thinks about it, he says, this is the story I have to share with you. There were these boys. They were troublemakers. But their mother always looked at them full of love. 
Even when they did the worst things and got sent to juvenile detention, her eyes, when she looked upon those boys, were full of love. And he says, when she got sick and was dying, and they called me in to bring the last rites to her. As he anointed her and they pray over her, and they're out in the hall talking and remembering, sharing the stories of her life. One of the boys says, well, there was this time when I was in juvie, and my mom came in and she had that look in her eyes. She always looked at me full of tenderness and love. And this one time while she's sitting there across from me, she says, is anyone looking? And he says, no, nobody's looking at us right now. And she pulls out of her bra his favorite burrito. <laughs> it wasn't a big one. It was a small one. <laughs> but it was the one he loved, the chili relleno from his favorite spot near where Father Boyle's place is. That she filled him up with her love, with her tenderness. And that's what the story of Ruth is about, right? Taking that woman who is broken and hurt in a place of sorrow and grief and tragedy. And Ruth continues to look at her with tenderness and love, to look at her and to bring her each step of the way closer to being filled, whether it's with a burrito or whether it's with a baby. She fills, fills Naomi up so that she can again be pleasant and be joyful and leave aside that bitterness, never forgetting the tragedy, but not allowing that emptiness to control who she will be going forward. And that's what we're invited to do in this story, right? To be the Ruth to those people that we know who are bitter and empty, who need someone to come alongside them and show them of God's presence and love, God's tenderness, to show them that life can be full, that they can be restored and they can be nourished. That's what makes this story so wonderful because it teaches us that step by step, day by day, through the ups and downs and through the hardness, we can move. We can move from feeling like we have no place and no home to being back in community, reconnected with our family, and feel at home where we are full, restored, and nourished. Amen.